Here we are at Common Bound 2016. I'm Laura Flanders. You can find more of my reporting at lauraflanders.com. But it has been a complete pleasure and a privilege to be with the amazing people of the New Economy Coalition at Common Bound. It's been a conference in Buffalo all weekend where really the best of the best of those who are working for a new economic picture and a new sense of social justice, uh, a new world really, um, where the best of the folks working on that particular mission have been coming together and sharing ideas, tactics, um, and what they've learned. One of the people that we've met on this trip, people working here in New York State, is our next guest. She is with us from the Working Families Party from upstate New York Working Families. She's the uh, organizing director. Her name is Brittany Baxter. Brittany, welcome to the program. Glad to have you. Thank you. Thank you. So you work with Working Families in upstate New York. What's your mission? What's your job? So I'm the upstate legislative organizer for New York Working Families and our mission is to engage voters and the citizens of this country and also electeds in issues around working families, uplifting the working class people that make this country great, and to ensure that we all live in a society where we all have access to quality food, access to jobs, clean air, and and labor. And so what are some of the challenges that people are facing in, here in upstate New York? So upstate New York is a it's such a diverse region. We have rural country, we have we have mountainous areas, we have cities that are, have fallen to decline due to the decline the industrial decline in the area. So we've lost jobs, we've lost people, we've lost resources. And the the main thing here is catching up with the rest of the world, right? We need to we need more investment in this area, but it needs to be responsible mm. investment. And um, my job now is to, I'm, I'm working on that in the environmental justice movement. Then. So you've laid out a large mission uh, with a lot of different players. I know that you prioritize working intersectionally. Absolutely. A, what does that mean? And B, very concretely, how do you do it? Hmm, that's a tough question. Oh, so like, what does it mean? <laughs> So intersectionality means that when we're talking about an issue, that there are many different layers of how this issue impacts a person. So race, gender, class, um, gender identity, and um, sexual orientation. Those are all things that affect how an issue impacts a person and understanding the, the nuances of how an issue will affect a person based on where they fall on that, on that line of privilege is is intersectionality and it's important to know because an issue will impact a middle class white woman differently than it will a a working class woman of color or an indigenous woman or an immigrant. Those are all and those are conversations that we need to have. How do we do that work? Oh, it is a painstakingly slow process, but it takes a lot of energy. Um, it's a lot of grassroots conversations, really intentional building relationships and communities that are disparately impacted by issues and also left out of conversations around solutions around those issues. So, so uh, on the, to the very nuts and bolts, in a town like Buffalo, you said we need jobs. Um, some company says, we want to come in and invest. The city gets to decide, do we or do we not give them a tax break? to come in and invest. Tax break will mean that we get fewer, re less revenues right now, but there'll be some jobs. People will be paying taxes if they're employed. Usually the city decides, yeah, let's go for it. Um, what would an intersectional approach look like? If, you, if I'm not pushing you too far. No, you're not, you're not. An intersectional approach would be, who are the people who need those jobs the most? What are those jobs paying? How much are we going to be paying this company? And will this be, will this company provide good quality jobs, health insurance? And will it also invest in the community that it's in? We have a lot of companies that come in and, and build in areas that are economically depressed, but there's not a lot of relationship building with the community. And there's also not a lot of investment in the surrounding community. I think a good example of a, an organization that actually does that is Harmac. They are a medical supply company, and they are based on 
in a really, really poor part of town, and they have invested, they have, they bought up land, and they've cleaned up the area around their, their site, because a lot of the people that live in the surrounding community work there, mm -hmm. and they've made, an, they've dedicated themselves to creating a relationship with the community in a very intentional mm -hmm. way, and that's something that when we're looking at communities that have been ignored, that that alone, just seeing those people and treating them like human beings and having a conversation and bringing them in, that that makes all of the difference. It, and it, I don't want to stereotype women as working outside of, you know, only working inside the home, because we know women, particularly women of color, have always worked outside the home. But there's something about taking into concern the community that to me rings as a kind of gender conscious approach, almost like a feminist approach. Absolutely. Is that oversimplifying? I, I think, not necessarily, I think that I think in the society that we live in, in which those issues become well, women's issues, as opposed to being the issues of people who have children. You know, we typically leave men out of the conversation around um, daycare and being able to spend time with your children. Um, that typically become falls on women, and because we live in that society, that is, it does become a gender issue. Mm -hmm. And it's good that we have, um, we're having these conversations now because that's also a paradigm shift that we need to have including men who want to be a part of their children's lives um, to actually be able to take time off of work when their their wife has a baby or if their significant other has a baby to, to actually be a part of that that child's life for those first, first few weeks. Um, so for me, it is a gender conscious issue, but I think we can go further and shift, shift the way that things are classified as gender mm -hmm. issues. Well, I'd love you to talk a little bit more about that, because you also said that sexuality was something to think about and that gender identity is something to think about. I'm so How, what difference does a gender identity conscious lens make to our common bound new economy building work? So I think that when we look at groups of people who are impacted when it comes to housing and jobs and just general treatment by the police, the LGBTQ community, specifically people of color who identify themselves as LGBTQ, typically have some of the worst statistics when it comes to housing and jobs. They are most likely to be unemployed. They are most likely to be homeless. They have, they are significant, they are overrepresented in the sex worker arena. And it's, it's a conversation that we have to have because these are people who are dehumanized simply for choosing to live the way that they were born and not being accepted by society. So that will take significant work to shift the societal norm to a place where people who have issues with, say, for example, the bathroom bill in North Carolina, um, literally the idea that someone has to be afraid for their life because they, they need to use a bathroom, which is an inherently human right to have access to a place to use a bathroom, the fact that we're having a conversation around whether or not that's okay for people says a lot about where we are as a society. And for me, it's, it's not okay to dehumanize someone who simply wants to use a bathroom and be safe. It's interesting to go to be here in Buffalo and to be having this conversation. I think of the, the landmark book by Leslie Feinberg around, um, in her case, sort of gender identity that was read as male, uh, she identified as a, as a woman. The book was out probably 20 years ago, it was Don't Butch Blues, but in that, she was a, a good activist organizer from the left. She wrote about how old blue collar jobs were the jobs where she felt most safe. Mm -hmm. uh, and with the, and there's lots of reasons for that, but there were protections against violence against workers mm -hmm. on the job, and there was a sense of a grievance procedure that had you inside of a group, your union, mm -hmm. um, not just you against your employer alone or a co-worker. Um, Listening to you, I'm thinking, oh, the decline of blue-collar work and union work has also left fewer spaces for people like Leslie um, and others to have safe work. Absolutely. I agree. Labor is an integral part of us as a society maintaining the middle class and also elevating social issues. I, I think that labor, from what I've seen, is taking an active role and shifting their focus to expanding it to working around social issues and not just workers' rights issues because all of those things 
intersect, right? Mm -hmm. To get back to intersectionality, those are things. So protecting just your workplace isn't enough anymore. Absolutely, because after you leave work, you go home to a community that if it's not safe, then you don't have the confidence that you, and, and you won't be able to focus to do the job that you've been hired to do, right? If you don't have access to transportation to get you to that job, that's a problem. And if you don't have access to good union jobs and they're not inclusive, that's an issue. And I think that we, we, I think as labor, as I've seen the last few years, has been really good about pushing themselves out of their comfort zones to address LGBTQ conversations, to address criminal justice issues, to address housing issues and, and issues around people who are being discriminated against, right? And that's difficult, right? It's uncomfortable and it's an amazing thing to see an entire movement shifting because it also is like, you have to bring those people in in order to survive because labor is under attack in this country. So we have to bring in the LGBTQ community. We have to bring in people of color. And we have to bring people, in immigrants and refugees. All those people that in the labor movement to give them half a chance. Absolutely. And, there is one. and they will carry it and they will flourish. So you sound excited. You're I'm always excited. <laughs> but what you're seeing is good. The work is going well. It is. It is. You know, we have roadblocks, but this is an imperfect world. And I think that we just have to keep pushing and not allow to have a, a strong sense of what the reality of our situation is, what the situation we're organizing in, but also to not allow that to defeat us or to compromise in our work. Brittany, it's great talking to you. Thanks for being Thank you. Us. Thank you for having me, Laura. You can find out more on this live stream at truthout.org. And thank you, Truthout, for partnering with us on the live streaming of the Come About 2016 conference. Have a great rest of the conference, everybody. Stay watching the tube. Stay watching the live stream.